on behalf of nnf gujarat i dr prashant karya secretary gujarat nnf welcome one and all to today's interesting discussion on recent changes in nrp i request president sandeep trivedi to welcome one and all sandeep bhai over to sandeep bhai hello welcome uh, dr somsekhar sir dr uh, vikas and dr akash and uh, this is very helpful uh, the topic is very helpful to the all the new and also nursing staff which is a uh, changes every changes in the nrp program so uh, this this topic is very helpful i have to over to prashant thank you thank you sandeep bhai and for today's presentation we do have a chairperson dr ronak patel dr ronak patel is a fellow in neonatology he is a director and in charge of neo kids children hospital palanpur he is secretary of aop banaskatha and ev member of nnf gujarat and aop gujarat he is trainer of iap nnf nrp hgm program and trained in point of care ultrasound program he contributed in many books and his main area of interest is neonatal resuscitation breastfeeding and point of care ultrasound so welcome dr ranak patel thank you so much are my slides visible yes yes perfect perfect thank you dr prashant for uh, kind introduction uh, am i audible sir yeah audible audible okay at the outset i would like to thank uh, uh, nnf gujarat team for giving the opportunity on this platform today we have three eminent uh, faculties in the field of neonatology especially the neonatal resuscitation program we have uh, dr professor uh, somshekhar nimalkar sir and uh, sir is a professor and head of the department of neonatology at pramukh swami medical college karamsad i think sir doesn't need any introduction he is uh, one of the strong and major pillar in the uh, field of uh, neonatal resuscitation program uh, we have uh, another uh, faculty with us is dr vikas goyal and uh, he is associated with uh, neonatal resuscitation program since 2008 and he is one of the, the strong pillar of uh, a neonatal resuscitation program in the india we have with us dr akash pank uh, uh, he is an additional professor in pediatrics aims nagpur and he is experience in uh, neonatal resuscitation program currently he is a waste journal coordination uh, coordinator at advanced nrp currently and he was a waste journal coordinator for basic nrp also and he has uh, been a trainer for various iap and nnf courses like nrp fd and c and all and i welcome uh, you all for today's topic so without wasting much time with uh, this short introduction uh, i will hand over the mic to uh, dr som shekhar sir please sir over to you yeah uh, thank you uh, uh, dr ronak uh, i hope that i should be able to uh it's a share the presentation it's a presentation that was recently given at uh, uh, pedicon in in noida and i'll be sharing some of the same slides uh, and i hope uh, i'll be able to make some uh, uh, headway in what what we think about it uh, you can hear me clearly is that correct yes correct uh, can you now see it full screen yes is it full screen also yeah okay perfect so uh, thank you uh, uh, dr prashant dr sandeep uh, and gujarat anand for allowing to present and i am happy to see dr vikas and dr akash sir who we will discuss the presentation is pretty long but uh, i'll try and skip through a lot of slides so we can have uh, some discussion at the end uh, so 
uh, we will go through this kind of uh, flow as to what what are we going to be doing uh, today and uh, so these are the various parts of neural research session that we'll, we will discuss uh, in short so the first thing is whether uh, training uh, people in in neural research resuscitation uh, does it uh, reduce birth asphyxia and neonatal mortality okay uh, so it is known and this is based on a, a systematic review that it can reduce uh, incidence of stillbirths okay uh, can reduce 7 day neonatal mortality by 47% and also 28 neonatal uh, 28 day neonatal mortality by 50% so definitely is shown that uh, it does improve uh, various uh, parameters so uh, getting trained in neonatal resuscitation or training uh, uh, healthcare workers in neonatal resuscitation does help improve neonatal mortality okay uh, so and this has been seen across uh, across various settings, including uh, high income set settings as well as uh, low income settings. Uh, and it is known that a lot of babies uh, just require simple newborn care, and around 15% will need stimul stimulation, and uh, a less number of them will require back and mask, and even less number will require intubation. So this is how it kind of uh, uh, training is uh, required. Uh, this is how evidence started. So long time back in the 1980s, 1970s, a group of people, uh, neonatal, neonatologists got together and found what is called as a neonatal uh, education book or uh, something what they felt was needed to start a neonatal resuscitation. So a lot of these people are still there. I think on the left uh, middle is Dr. William Keenan on the left hand, most left hand is Dr. Errol uh, Alden and, and so on so forth. Uh, but in, since 2000, the American Academy of Pediatrics along with AHA, and other uh, resuscitation uh, societies uh, across the world got together and formed ILCOR and uh, began uh, kind of uh, promoting uh, guidelines. So the first guidelines came around, I think, 99, 2000. Uh, it was initially formed in 1992 as a, a committee uh, and then began sending out advisory statements since 1997. Okay. And the new, new newborn resuscitation initial statement came out in 1999. Uh, following which updated guidelines were issued in 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015, and now latest in 2020. Uh, following 2015 guidelines, they try then what they tried and did is tried and started giving uh, continuous guidelines every year. So uh, any small change that happened, they changed the guideline a little bit, but uh, the over and con complete overall of guidelines or improved guidelines were re, re uh, redone in at, at the end of five years. So uh, small changes were published in 98 and 99, but uh, and the entire setup was kind of redone in 2020. Uh, we'll see how, uh, il so this is how kind of the ILCOR does the, uh, does the guide guidelines guidance. Uh, and they use uh, various uh, evidence evaluations, so different kind of evidence evaluations, which are systematic reviews, evidence updates, and scoping reviews. So the differences between these three are basically the speed and uh, with, each, with which it, they are done and the comprehensiveness of, with which they are done. So they're slightly different with systematic reviews taking long time and requiring more uh, a more rigorous process while the other two requiring a less rigorous process uh, they use grade uh, which is commonly used in most uh, guidelines currently and they also use what is called as a certainty of evidence so uh, these are the ways in which they kind of define uh, how evidence uh, changes uh, so so whenever guidelines come out they have guidelines and along with they have what is called as the COSTR or the consensus and on science and treatment recommendation so it, that the COSTR tries to explain how the guidelines came about. So if you look at the guideline of you know, resuscitation that was published in 2020, October, uh, the guidelines will be probably seven to eight to nine pages long. But if you look at the COS tier of that guideline, that, uh, that document would be around 40 or 50 pages long because that document explains how the changes came about and what was discussed in those changes. So uh, if you read the COS tier in detail, you get to know uh, how the guidelines were changed and why they were changed, okay? Uh, so if you look at the screen, there is something called as the strength of the recommendation and the level of evidence. So uh, level of evidence is based upon what kind of uh, evidence is being used, whether it is a systematic review, a RCT or a, a case, case series and so on and so forth. And the strength of the recommendation is how strong that particular committee felt that this recommendation should be. So red is very weakly felt and uh, green is very strongly felt. So, uh, level of evidence is based on the quality of scientific evidence and uh, class of recommendation is based on this, uh, the strength of the recommendation, the, how the writing group feels about. So these are kind of slightly two uh, different things. So class one on the on, on the left hand most side in green is a uh, strong recommendation for a, a potential benefit which uh, greatly outweighs uh, risk and class two moderate recommendation for which benefit most, most likely uh, outweighs the risk. 
and class to be where weak recommendation for which unknown whether benefit will or whether risk or not and so on and so forth this is how this kind of uh, changes and class 3 the lowest at the bottom is strong recommendation for which uh, the risk outweighs the potential benefit uh the level of evidence on uh, on, on in in uh, in blue is level a which is the highest and as you go down uh randomized non randomized studies uh limited data and the lowest level in white is uh, is ceo which is uh, consensus of expert opinion here so that is the lowest level of evidence which is there and it is very important to understand that you can have a relatively low level of evidence but a higher strength of class of recommendation or you might have a higher level of evidence uh, but you might have a lower a lower strength of recommendation so there might be uh, these are these do not go uh, hand in hand always okay more likely to go in hand in but if it doesn't go hand in it is still still okay okay and a recommendation of loec does not imply that the recommendation is uh, weak uh, now what happens is uh, if you if you look at what is called as aha so aha is the american heart association uh, which forms research decision guidelines for the us and the north canadian uh, and uh, us basically not canadian uh, uh, us uh, and many of the countries in the world follow uh, the aha guidelines uh, so ilcor makes the recommendations then every country or every region sits separately and then decides its own guidelines uh, the european uh, countries together form what is called as european research decision council and this council again uh, utilizes the ilcor guidelines to form their own separate uh, guidelines uh, now if you look at this year's uh, aha guidelines this is in the sense 2020 and 2021 if you look at the guidelines of aha and erc uh, you will find that uh, though ilcor guidelines are the same Uh, aha uses a slightly different uh, kind of uh, guideline or has a slightly different recommendation as compared to the uh, european research decision council which we will see in the next uh, next few slides okay uh, so this is the uh, so the point w- what i want to make is uh, though the evidence base may be the same uh, though the research studies that they are looking at may be the same uh, different people will interpret that particular evidence based upon their conditions uh, as to what they have and then they will make a separate uh, what do you say Uh, guideline. Uh, so overall, uh, if you see from 2020 to around now 2020, 2020, uh, the guidelines have improved. Uh, the evidence base has increased, and uh, guidelines are more evidence based. Uh, so this is your uh, NRP NRP guidelines, which are there. Uh, they have not changed in the AHA from 2015 to 2020. You can look at the algorithm, and the algorithm is same. Uh, and the book has changed slightly, but uh, more or less. Uh, there is more evidence for the older things which is available and so that's not really changed much okay this is your european research region council guidelines so the one, one on the left is uh, which is less busy is the 2015 guideline and the one on the right is 2020 which looks more busy so you can see there is a slight change in the way the algorithm is presented in the european research region council okay there are slight changes in, in delivery temperature there are slight changes in inspired option for preterm baby and delayed cord clamping is more emphasized the european research decision council has a separate way of defining a transition what it defines satisfactory transition incomplete transition and a poor of failed transition uh, and as you can see it depends upon tone heart rate uh, and as the heart rate worsens or becomes slower or the baby becomes floppy it is poor of failed transition uh, satisfactory transition and poor of failed transition is easy to understand uh, but it becomes interesting as to how you respond to a uh, incomplete transition so Uh, that is something which uh, uh, where uh, there is a slight difference between what aha does and what erc does okay now most of the guidelines uh, rear from the major things so uh, they apply to the newly born baby but they can also be used for babies up till 28 days of life so it's not just only for the newly born but the evidence base for most of these guidelines is based on the newly born they are not uh, if you can apply the same guidelines for a 28 old, old baby or a maybe a 1 kg baby at 2 uh, months of life uh, but there is no evidence for that particular using that but this particular guidelines for a 2 month old 1 kg baby but because there are no separate guidelines we can still use use the same uh, same ones okay uh, lung inflation and ventilation of the body is the most important thing as we say, as we all know and Uh, it reaffirms establishment and maintenance of cardiovascular and temperature stability for the promotion of mother and infant bed, uh, bonding and breastfeeding uh, so these are all the things that are kind of reaffirmed by aha 
anticipation and preparation and cord management. Now, one thing to understand between the European Council recommendation and the AHA recommendations is that while the AHA recommendations or the CO, uh, guidelines that are published are based upon uh, questions that were asked this time and it addresses only questions that were asked in this particular iteration of the 2020 guidelines and it just continues with what was said in the 2020, 2015 and 2010 guidelines for various questions that were not asked for, that were not discussed for or for what evidence was not sought. Uh, but the ERC guidelines, which actually came up a little later in 2021, uh, they looked at the processes. So it, when they looked at what ILCOR had done in 2020, they continued with the same and gave guidelines according to the interpretation. But they also looked at a lot of questions that were not, not looked at by ILCOR and then did short, uh, short evidence-based uh, surveys or uh, scoping reviews for all those questions which were initially addressed in 2010 and 2015. And based upon that, they uh, made a little bit changes. So uh, the ERC document, the European Association Council document, actually is, is a standalone document which looks at all the questions completely and presents its evidence base accordingly while the aha document or the aap document uh, that is published looks at only newer questions as far as evidence is concerned and continues using the older uh, guidelines without looking at evidence again for 2010 and 2015 so uh, i don't know if i'm able to make you understand this but so that's the major difference between the uh, two guidelines that are, that have come out so when you look at these guidelines you should understand that the way they are made is slightly different and hence there might be different changes between these two particular uh, guidelines. So uh, these are all suggested. So we know all this will not change. This has not changed much. Okay, PPV. So we'll see what are the differences between the two uh, guidelines. Uh, since I've been speaking for almost around 20 minutes, I think I can just stop here uh, because it might get boring and maybe we can have uh, Vikas and uh, Aka say something before I kind of continue with uh, the presentation. That would be better. Maybe Vikas and Akash, you have any yeah. things to say? Maybe five minutes and then I can continue with the presentation. Yeah. So, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, there is slight echo, yes, but sir. we can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. So, uh, to make it simple for the audience, I think, uh, they are more. Voice is echoing, sir. Voice is echoing. Voice is echoing. Are you alone? Is it okay now? Because now it is okay. The second because time it was okay. Vikas disappeared. I, I can't see him. He is lost. So maybe Akash, you can continue till Vikas joins back. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, the, if you look at the 2020 guidelines, in last uh, five to ten years, uh, more and more emphasis has been. It is being given on uh, a few things. Uh, first of which includes team management and uh, uh, prenatal risk assessment. So first important thing that to, uh, 2020 guidelines talks about is uh, a rearrangement of the questions and rearrangement of the, um, the, 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 the plan in which we decide the perinatal risk assessment and also the uh, team behavior is more uh, emphasized upon. So I have, uh, when I teach my postgraduates, I have prepared a mnemonic which I, I can share with you. Uh, this is some hi-fi. This looks like <laughs> we are peeping out of some bus window or something. Great, great. So uh, I teach that uh, you, all of us, we need practical more than theory, right? So remember the word practical. Uh, the PRA stands, practical, PRA, that stands for perinatal risk assessment. Then you have C, C for cord management. So you have to know uh, the plan of cord management has now been included in the questions uh, and the, the, the prenatal plan. Then T for team uh, briefing. So when you are preparing, your team needs to be briefed, team needs to be prepared together. They need to be shared about the risk factors. And then the whole team needs to be on the same page and the role allotment and everything needs to be done before. And then C, C for cleaning. So usme sara team jo hai, wo team saath mein hand washing karega clean. Uh, so uh, you can remember uh, hand washing by using it as C cleaning. So practical. So last jo A and L hai. A for assemble the equipment and L for look at the function. So only assembling the equipment is not important, not enough. But we also need to look at whether they are functioning or not. So 
these are few things uh, which you can you can make a checklist in uh, your labor room and you can teach that the checklist needs to be checked every time every time there is a delivery whether there is a uh, the, there is an anticipated high risk baby or not every delivery as we know can turn out to be uh, stormy and high risk so we need to be prepared for resuscitation so i think that is one then few things as we can uh, keep discussing as soam goes along a uh, few things mm. that i feel are most important jisko hum sar bol sakte hain so delivering on mother's abdomen delayed cord clamping oxygen uh, only when necessary suction only when necessary so suction has been de emphasized so these things we will discuss as i think uh, yeah. we go along yeah akash thank you <coughs> thanks sir i'll uh, yeah. shall continue now and we can have no som sekar i will yeah. have to give 5 okay. minutes <coughs> okay okay so i want i want to highlight the changes which has occurred during the years because here many participants would have done their nrp training or read about nrp a few years back 5 years back 10 years back 15 years back so what has changed in years that i will summarize in few words the first thing which has changed is we have to prepare better earlier the preparation part was not given so much emphasis now assessment of risk and preparation is the key for a good resuscitation that is still lacking in our friends who are going for an uh, labor room call so this is my uh, uh, very important point which i want to share with you that you should be knowing the antenatal risk factors associated with that particular delivery and also you should prepare better second important thing was the meconium thing earlier everybody of you uh, might be knowing that whenever there is meconium we used to endotrach intubate the baby and do the suction of the meconium in different conditions now it has been said that ventilating the baby is the most important step so presence of meconium or non presence of meconium doesn't make any sense if the baby is non vigorous then you should start with ventilation and don't try to extract the meconium out of mouth other than the routine suctioning which we are doing don't even do a deep suctioning don't do endotracheal intubation don't do deep suctioning just routine suctioning and then don't waste time and go for ventilation third point which which important uh, has changed is delayed cord clamping now it is very important to delay the cord clamping for at least 30 second this is ap's statement but our iap says that it should be delayed by 1 minute if the baby is vigorous or baby is crying or breathing at birth for this for to delay the cord clamping now you will have to put the baby or to deliver the baby on to the mother's abdomen okay so this is third change fourth important point is we should not do undue suction as we were doing previously suction has to be done only if the child is not breathing or if he is having a copious amount of secretions coming out from his mouth this is fourth point fifth major change which occurred in the years is use of oxygen earlier in our residency period of time we used 100% oxygen for every baby who was delivering in labor room now this should not be used it should all the term baby more than 35 weeks more than 35 weeks should be started with room air only and even if you find a baby cyanos then you should start with 30% of oxygen and titrate upwards according to the pulse oximeter reading so these are the few major changes which have occurred in nrp and i think they have made our life easier earlier the life was difficult we have to do many things but now it is very easy so now if anybody says that he has difficulty in practically applying this uh, resuscitation uh, algorithm then it is wrong you can very well apply this on in your on your babies and you will get a very good result next som sekar sir sir we have received one question that yeah. initially in 2010 there was a question uh, about the number of babies why that was removed no that was not well, that we uh, that comes in antenatal risk uh, when we are talking about antenatal risk factors na we are asking just before the delivery that how many babies because the babies won't be there on that time only so that can be removed from that pool but previously we are asking whenever there is an now there is a risk chart available so if there is uh, more than one babies then it is a type of risk and you have to act according earlier it was not there so it was asked at the delivery 
sir you are muted question is still there but it is in a different place and in a different format so i think that in yeah. terms of whether question is still there it's not there in in the way it was put initially so this we have yeah. discussed a little bit uh, in terms of auction therapy uh, yeah. there are more changes in this in the in the erc recommendations as we'll see later on chest compression has remained remain the same and umbilical venous access is preferred uh, and medications has changed a little bit we we'll see what has changed uh, later yeah. on uh, so uh, anticipation of resuscitation is very important and it has been shown that if you don't anticipate resuscitation or if you don't prepare for resuscitation then the chances of uh, neonatal mortality in babies that i attended uh, kind of tend to increase so this is something which is uh, again having a, a good class of recommendation one as you can see uh, but the level of evidence is not 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 very high okay so what we has discussed earlier team briefings communication all those all those are important uh, so the questions have changed in the aha guidelines if you look at them from how many babies to umbilical cord management plan so when you look at umbilical cord management plans you have to understand that there might be two cords three cords so again you may not directly think of how many babies but there are uh, cords that you have to think about so your plan changes accordingly it's, it's not completely gone out per se yeah. so umbilical cord management uh, vikas has talked about already about 30 seconds and and, and one minutes so i will show you what is different uh, in between the erc guidelines and the aha guidelines uh, very clearly is we should not be milking uh, in babies uh, less than 28 weeks of gestation so that's something which is important and delay delayed cord clamping is always always better okay uh, and you might want to consider uh, early cord clamping uh, for a few things like uh, maternal hemorrhage or hemodynamic instability or placental abruption and placenta previa so few places where you can think about it so ilco 2020 specifically did not directly address umbilical cord management uh, aha made a weak recommendation uh aha made a strong recommendation for not milking babies less than 28 weeks gestation and erc as like in india we suggest that we should be delaying cord clamping by at least uh, 60 seconds now as i mentioned earlier incomplete transition uh, when baby is having heart rate between 60 to 100 and inadequate breathing efforts an option to delay cord clamping while pro- providing appropriate thermal care and initial steps of resuscitation was suggested by erc if you look at the discussions that happen among on resuscitation tables or when we train people ask is kya karna hai so here is where aha differs slightly from erc erc says that you can do delayed cord clamping and we generally say that we should try and delay cord clamping as much as possible so uh, when people talk they say ki book mein aisa nahi likha hai so my main point is evidence keeps on changing and what might be not written as uh, to be done in the aha guidelines may be written as to be done in the european guidelines or the nls guidelines of uk for example we'll come to that later uh, that are called as insufflation breaths or uh, sustained inflations uh, that was supposed to be given so the nls recommended five sustained inflations uh, in the 2015 guidelines which was not there in the aha uh, aha guidelines uh so different societies will have slightly different guidelines and doesn't mean ki uh, as sustained infections are new and better it is just the way of that that country or that region looking at in a in a different fashion okay so erc recommend recommends immediate cord clamping only when the baby is fully limp so when it is a failed transition okay and uh, uh, erc recommends uh, umbilical cord milking for, milking for preterm babies more than 28 weeks if if delayed cord clamping is not possible okay so this is something which is very clear uh, temperature at birth so it is very important to understand that uh, temperature of birth or the delivery room should be kind of maintained uh, pretty well because hypothermia at the admission in the nice is a independent risk factor uh, for mortality neonatal mortality okay uh, so here we can see that healthy baby should be kept skin to skin can so there was i think uh, akash mentioned about this that all babies who are born need and it is more and more emphasized from 2010 to 2020 it has been emphasized that babies should be kept skin to skin care uh, and i think in many places in india practice has slowly improved over the last 10 12 years some places that is still not there uh, but practices have definitely uh, improved uh, so this is definitely there and uh, plastic covering are shown to reduce the incidence of hypothermia uh, but we are not directly compared to un- uninterrupted skin to skin care uh, so ilkor uh, mentioned about uh, delivery room temperature of 23 to 25 okay uh, plastic wraps or bags thermal mattresses and warm humidified gases for resuscitation so this is all based on a weak recommendation based on a low le- low level of uh, low level of evidence uh, so aha has, has not changed much uh, but uh erc changes so i will show you in the next uh, few slides how uh, things have changed in erc 
So this we have discussed and talked about it. So now ERC 2021 has a slightly different way of looking at it. The baby is less than 28 weeks. It clearly mentions that the delivery room temperature is supposed to be more than uh, 25 degrees centigrade. And for other rest of the baby, it can be between 23 to 25 degrees centigrade, uh, the delivery room temperature. Uh, ERC spe specifically recommends skin to skin care for babies more than 32 weeks. EHS is silent on that. And ERC cautioned that the new RCD found that newborns between 28 and 32 weeks gestation had a lower body mean temperature when receiving skin to skin care with conventional management. So, ERC is slightly cautious on uh, saying that all babies that are born even preterm should receive skin to skin care. Uh, this is not specifically addressed in AHA, AHA recommendations at all. Uh, why is this important? Because many Scandinavian countries, not Europe as a whole, but many Scandinavian countries specifically mentioned that or they want in their in their guidelines like Norway, etc., that all babies which are born should be kept skin to skin care. Whether it, even if they are very preterm, very small, they still keep them skin to skin care. So this is kind of uh, guidelines of the ERC and not uh, a few countries because that's the reason why it is specified. Uh, in their guidelines. AHA doesn't talk much about this because they usually don't keep them skin to skin care. So add even at birth. So there the practice is relatively less. Uh, this is the importance of local uh, cultures or local practices and how recommendations are shaped by local practices. Uh, so initial steps of slightly change. If you look at uh, what happened, uh, in, uh, initially stimulate was at the end. And now stimulate is, is in the middle as far as uh, recommendations has changed. Uh, then uh, there, there is, I think, uh, there are a systematic reviews currently for stimulation of babies which are going on, and that might change again in in the 2025 uh, 2025 guidelines. So this is about meconium uh, that babies uh, what Vikas mentioned, and uh, we should try and avoid unnecessary suctioning and uh, avoid bradycardia. Uh, so maybe I'll stop here and we can have a discussion on meconium for some minute. Uh, Akash and Vikas. Akash, Mishra. evidence for meconium. So I think um, uh, we we all uh, we all must be proud about the fact that the evidence for change of practice as far as meconium is concerned has actually come from India. So the uh, AP uh, the the textbook of uh, neonatal resuscitation actually mentions that, and uh, I think uh, there are uh, uh, we now have enough evidence to uh, uh, to to make it quite clear that intratracheal suction in the practice of intratracheal suctioning uh, for meconium stained baby does not create any change in uh, outcome and does not improve uh, mortality or even uh, composite outcomes or the uh, other outcomes uh, uh, other neonatal outcomes so uh, the 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 jury is quite clear about it that meconium management is actually in terms of uh, intratracheal suctioning and all, uh, all is not recommended now so meconium management of a meconium stained baby is to summarize in no way different than management of a baby born out of a clear lyca. The question here uh, sometimes uh, participants and students ask is, if it is not any different, if there is no difference, then why do we ask that question in the beginning? Why do we uh, include that as a prenatal risk assessment? So the answer here is that presence of meconium just kind of cautions you. It uh, it helps you in anticipation, it helps you in planning, and it, it kind of tells you, it indicates you that the baby uh, may have some distress or may have some, uh, this may be a high-risk baby. Apart from that, there is no uh, difference of meconium uh, in uh, management. And in fact, uh, if you carefully look, Som actually pointed it out, that in the initial steps, the earlier sequence was uh, position, suction, dry, stimulate and reposition. So many people used to think and even teach that if there is meconium or if there is a lot of secretion, then suctioning should be done before drying. Because when we dry, the baby is likely to gasp and uh, the, the, the whatever is there in the mouth or nose that may go inside. So drying should be, uh, suctioning should be done before drying. That was the teaching. But if you see the current, uh, current sequence of the initial steps, it is actually drying, then stimulating, then um, positioning, and then in the end, suctioning if necessary. So this is a very, very important change, which, which actually goes in line with the, uh, with the, with the principle that uh, suctioning is not necessary. Suctioning should be done only if uh, needed, and it is drying and stimulating that uh, helps more in establishing uh, ventilation and respiration.
Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Vikas. You uh, so I just wanted yes. to say before Vikas. So in 2015, the Meconium guideline changed based on one RCT that was published and one which was probably presented but not published. And both were from India. And uh, then uh, based on that 2015 guidelines, uh, there was a paper published in 2018 in pediatrics from a US NIC which looked at change in practice. So what they did, they did before 2015 and after 2015, uh, what happened to management of babies who were born through meconium. Uh, before 2015, they were suctioned and be after 2015, they were not suctioned. Uh, they showed uh, that there was no difference between the two, two babies, two kinds of babies. So now mm -hmm. recently, I think last month or this month, Last month, March, there was a paper published from uh, India, which again did a similar study based on uh, bef before meconium suctioning was done and after meconium suctioning was stopped. Uh, and they also found that there is no difference between the babies born through meconium uh, when the guideline was changed. So uh, these two are kind of before after studies, one from the developed country, one from India, uh, which show that change of guideline actually does, hasn't changed the outcome of uh, babies as much. Uh, and so the time wasted uh, in um, doing meconium suction of the baby and uh, cleaning the trachea uh, uh, can be definitely used for ensuring that ventilation happens earlier. So, I don't know, Vikas wanted to say something? Yeah. No, uh, I just want to add this thing uh, that there is one this phrase that we need, uh, we don't need a dead baby with clean trachea and we need a live baby. So, to have a live baby, you will have to ventilate. So the most important crux of our resuscitation program is how you can ventilate the baby within first minute if the baby requires. So therefore, it is called first golden minute project also. So this is the first golden minute. And the only rule is that you should be able to ventilate the baby within one minute if the baby is not breathing. Uh, so that is um, the, the most important thing which will... Uh, uh, which will help in saving the babies, not any other uh, things which we are doing. Thank you. So, I don't know, immersive may I'm going to ice the car. I'm going to ice the car. So, I share. Registan ka kar do isko. So, here we are. So, endotracheal yeah. suction, we have discussed this uh, quite, quite a bit quite a bit and this is based on evidence uh, as we discussed. Uh, in terms of uh, assessing heart rate, now this is slightly different between AHA and the ERC guidelines. Uh, in 2010, I think uh, the guidelines came about saying that we should start using pulse oximeter and assessment of heart rate was um, still based on, uh, I think, cord, cord pulsation and stethoscope. I think 2015 cord pulsation kind of went off and in 2020, it's still based on heart rate and in 2015 came ECG, ECG was added and in 2020 ECG is continued as being important for measuring heart rate. So what they say is we should be having both pulse oximeter and ECG uh, to e evaluate heart rate. Okay, uh, clinical assessment of heart rate by auscultation or palpation may be unreliable and inaccurate is based on what the AHA and the ILCOR says. Okay, and so pulse oximetry, when we look at the heart rate by pulse oximetry, when you put the pulse oximeter on the hand of the baby, on the wrist of the baby, on the right wrist of the baby, the time for it to actually show actually varies from at least 60 seconds to around one and a half minute. There are two ways of attaching the pulse, ox uh, pulse oximeter. First to the hand of the baby and then to the machine. And then there was a question whether to the machine first and to the hand of the baby. So there's to be a specific teaching in the 2015 guideline it, uh, in the way it needs to be done. But there was an RCT from Chandigarh which showed uh, that if you use either method, the difference in timing of getting the getting the trace is actually just two to three seconds. So ultimately, if you look at this particular book, it doesn't matter which way you attach, but you need to attach early because it takes around minimum 60, 70 seconds to so at least roughly around 90 seconds for the uh, pulse of stress to show. <clears throat> so then people started using ECG so that you can pick up heart rate earlier. But even heart rate uh, ECG has been seen that you require around at least 60 seconds for you to actually have a consistent proper heart rate. So there is a slight difference in, into how uh, this is looked at by ERC and AHA. Uh, why is heart rate uh, this important? Because uh, you need to understand as to whether the baby is doing well or not doing well based upon your heart rate estimation. So having an accurate estimation of heart rate is useful and hence ECG is stressed. Uh, we, uh, IAP and NNF currently also don't recommend saying that we should be using ECG, though uh, they recommend that we should be using pulse ox as much as possible. Okay, so that is one thing that I wanted to point out. So coming to, uh, so look, this is ECG, then the evidence for ECG is not very great. I don't think there are any studies which have shown that using ECG has improved outcomes for neural resuscitation, but it is still a recommendation by, by AH and INCOR. 
Now, this will, I talked about how AHA has a strong recommendation based on expert consensus. Uh, so, low level of evidence, but a strong recommendation. But ERC has sli a slightly different view. ERC recommends usage of a stethoscope and a saturation monitor with or without ECG for continuous assessment, assessment during resuscitation. So, Europe is kind of conservative and tries, say, tries to say that uh, ECG is good, but that's okay. If you don't have ECG, you can still continue with stethoscope and saturation monitor, which is more in line with what... Uh, we in India tend to say that we should be using saturation monitor and a stethoscope. So, uh, ECG is still, uh, why, is, why is all this important? Because uh, uh, America, which follows the ECG guidelines or needs ECG, is a litigious city and they require, uh, suppose somebody, something happens and somebody goes to court, they can say that you did not use ECG and you have not gone with the guidelines. So, so those kind of things uh, are important in the US, but uh, Europe is not so litigious as far as uh, uh, litigation is concerned in terms of in, in medical circles. Uh, coming to ventilation, so ventilation, there is a slight change in which the rates are given. So uh, it says about 40 to 60 meters uh, per minute PPV should be given. Okay, and, and delay in initiating ventilator support in newborn infants is increase the risk of death. So we, we have uh, discussed this. Uh, so we're looking at a rise in heart rate and less reliably at chest expansion. So this is something which people need to understand. Instead of trying to achieve very good chest expansion or seeing very visual lot of chest expansion, it is important to ensure that the ventilation is good enough to cause a rising heart rate and not ballooning chest rise, which can actually damage the lungs. So you should ensure that uh, you should do just enough chest rise so that there is a, uh, a rise in heart rate. Okay, and the peak inflation pressures according to AHA are 20 to 25, and the optimal PEEP has not been determined. So we do not, we, we actually don't use PEEP, but where they're using TPs, etc., and which should be used more frequently, as, at least for preterm babies, uh, the PEEP should be uh, around five, 5 centimeters of water. And AHA says, or the LCOR says that there, should, there may be potential harm in providing sustained inflation of greater than 10 seconds for preterm newborns, okay? And um, they don't say anything about between 1 to 10 seconds. So there is, and CPAP can be used for babies, preterm babies, when there is difficulty in breathing uh, uh, after birth or after resuscitation. So you can use CPAP. So CPAP is recommended. And I think CPAP has been recommended since 2010 guidelines. Now here's the difference between the three, uh, between AH and ERC. Uh, AHA 2020 made a very clear cut recommendation against use of sustained inflation of so more than 10 seconds. And AHA made a moderate recommendation to use the inspiratory time of one second for both preterm and uh, term newborns. So, the uh, speed at which you kind of cause uh, do the bagging, that's what uh, it says. ERC specifically rec recommended using five inflation of two to three second duration, but no specific recommendation regarding longer duration sustained inflation. So, these are very kind of a specific recommendation as far as using initial inflation. So, um, they are slightly different if you look at, uh, look at them. Okay. Uh, ILCOR 2020 20 and from 2005 recommended a rate of 30 to uh, 60. AHA has made a PPV rate of 40 to 60, which is there in our textbook, uh, which our IIP is using. Uh, and uh, the PIP of 20 to 25 is written in the uh, AHA recommendation. Uh, ERC, on the other hand, uses a PPV rate of 30, 30 per minute uh, after the initial five inflations and the PIP of uh, peak in, uh, inspiratory pressure of 30 uh, for, for term newborns. So, these are slightly different between AHA and ERC recommendations and ERC recommends an initial PIP of around 25 centimeters of water. Uh, so, and ERC very clear, clear, clearly says that using a lower PIP of 20, uh, might, result in, might result in under ventilation of uh, preterm newborns. And there's something called as a 2% technique. I don't think I have a picture, but uh, what uh, ERC recommends very clearly is holding the mask on the baby's face uh, should be done by, by 2%. When I say 2% technique, it is not uh, chest compression and ventilation where two people are required, what was taught like in 2010, but this is uh, the way in which the mask is held over the uh, baby. So a second person holding the mask with a jaw thrust resulted in a reduction in the leak surrounding the mask as well. So we don't teach it in the IAP and NF courses, uh, this 2% uh, technique, but this is what is recommended in the, uh, by, by the ERC. Uh, uh, Akshay, you want Shonsever, to say yeah. 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 Uh, this technique is also written in this uh, our textbook of this hmm. American Academy of Video, a, AP textbook also, hmm. but nobody uh, looks at it uh, and it is a very good technique where two persons, one person holds the mask and one person begs the ventilation. Uh, it is written when in MR Supa. Hmm. Okay. When you are uh, 
that is written two percent technique now it has been mentioned in the eighth edition in the eighth edition okay, in the eighth edition so that's uh, so that's more of a so it's yeah. it's there i think what happened what happened in the guidelines it is not there but they yeah. looked at the erc in the recommendations which came in later on in january yeah. and utilized it in the book so yeah. in the, in the guidelines is, is not mentioned but then yeah. they're in the book so i think we discussed yeah. this during in noida yeah. yeah. uh so coming to oxygen so this, again it is mainly uh, this is mainly based on studies done in spain uh, and and india and i think yeah these two countries where uh, people started using uh, room air for resuscitation of term babies now there are very specific guidelines by uh, by erc uh ilcor and aha gave a recommendation that uh, preterm babies less than 35 weeks of gestation uh, can be uh, initiated ventilation with uh, fio of 21 to 30% while the erc uh, suggests that for babies more than 32 weeks you can use room air so you can see that uh, between 32 to 20 35 weeks uh, erc recommends using room air uh, while aha suggests that you can use a higher level of uh, oxygen for 28 to 31 Uh, ERC suggests between 21 to 30 percent and less than 28 weeks. Uh, ERC suggests uh, recommends uh, 30 percent FIO2, so some oxygen to the baby. Okay. Uh, in all circumstances, uh, ERC suggests that babies less than 32 weeks gestation uh, at around five minutes of age, uh, uh, if the oxygen and oxygen saturation of below 80 and a heart rate of less than 100 should be avoided, uh, which means that your FIO2 can actually increase to ensure that your oxygen saturation goes up above 80 yeah. so this is very clearly written uh, in in the erc recommendation now uh, this this is significant because uh, this is different between the uh, two two guidelines uh, per se so if somebody is making annotations they may not make it okay yeah. then uh, so i'll stop sharing here yeah. i'll restart yeah you want to say something so yeah i want to say something regarding this oxygen uh, thing now as we all know that uh, it is still not practically possible in our india in many places we do not have blenders in labor room so what next best we can do is uh, the recommendation is that if below 35 you have to start with 30% of oxygen so above 35 weeks we will use room air it is okay with all of them all of you now if the baby is below 35 what you can do is whenever you are ventilating the baby with bag and mask please do not use the reservoir so please do not use the reservoir without reservoir the oxygen fio2 which is going out with the bag and mask is around 40% which is still acceptable than the 90 to 99% which comes with the reservoir so i will uh, ask you everybody uh, everybody to please remove your reservoir whenever you are using it on a less than 35 week baby when you are starting the ventilation but remember if the heart rate goes below 60 then you will have to provide 100% oxygen at that time you can attach the reservoir it has been specifically told in our that basic nrb module also that we are attaching reservoir only when the heart rate was less than 60 second and chest compression was required so before that if blender is not available you can use this technique to reduce the damage done by the 100% oxygen that you can do Yeah, so uh, there are remove, some questions. There are some questions. Remove reservoir. Are... Remove reservoir, but attach hundred percent oxygen. Yeah, yeah, attach hundred percent oxygen. So uh, attach oxygen. Hundred <laughs> percent oxygen tubing to the bag, but re- remove the reservoir. Yeah. yeah so so uh, there are questions. Uh, Doctor Prakul yeah. has asked for delayed cord climbing. It is sixty seconds or until umbilical cord pulsation stop. No. Uh, so the recommended guideline is sixty seconds. It is sixty okay, so seconds. It is sixty seconds. So it is sixty uh, seconds. If you if you do it at sixty five seconds or two minutes, you will not catch anyone's neck. But if you yeah. do it before sixty nine, sixty seconds, then we will say it is wrong. Yeah. Okay. So sixty seconds or more. So sixty seconds is preferable. Uh, then so, there is a question. Yeah. So so I just wanted to add one thing about delayed cord clamping. We yeah. all of us we need to remember that cord is. Yeah. the the system which is providing oxygenation to the baby inside the uterus so when a baby is not crying it is the cord actually which is providing oxygen we forget that and we all are in a hurry to clamp cord so uh, uh, we need to remember that cord is actually the oxygen uh, providing system also when we said delayed we need to remember that it is delayed clamping of cord not clamp immediately and then cut delayed after 1 minute yeah. that should not be there yeah. 
sorry uh, so the yeah. question was uh, on court clamping so that we have said then there is a discussion that uh, what is the opinion of the panel regarding use of tps for term opening babies instead of conventional ipv system so basically mm -hmm. instead of bag and mask can we use uh, uh, what is it uh, uh, tps so uh, tps can be used there is no no That's difference uh, in uh, we, would, we would prefer uh, so it, yeah. it becomes kind of a regular thing for for everyone so tp tp should be uh, uh, the use is still very low and uh, we think that its use should increase because it is a better device and uh, it will prove more helpful for those who can afford it because you will require a uh, source of compressed gas and oxygen uh, in that labor room. So in the facilities where it is available, they should 100% use, use this because it is better than the bag and mask. So uh, this is our recommendation also and we are also seeing in our training also. Uh, so, uh, there are various kinds of TPs that are available. So, there are certain TPs which have inbuilt uh, this uh, oximeter. So, that we, we uh, what do you say, blender. So, there are TPs blender. with blender uh, and yeah. they are pretty heavy, but they are pretty useful and it can, you can carry it from place to place. Uh, the point about blenders is uh, you need to ensure that there is uh, many of the places where we attend deliveries may not have compressed air. There might be oxygen, but there may not be compressed air. So, ensuring having compressed air in the facilities that you attend is, is needed. So, people don't think air is important, but air becomes very important when you are using a uh, blender. So, yes, that, that is something which you should remember. So, I think we'll go ahead if there are no particular questions. Uh, sir, uh, we have received few questions, practical okay. questions actually. Yeah. And we'll take it. Uh, if mother is having HIV or the baby is hydroxyphetalis in RH setup, then is it okay to do a delayed cord clamping? Dr. Vikas? Yeah, but uh, regarding HIV, I don't think there is any guidelines. But for high drops, you should not do it. For high drops, there is a uh, thing that you should not delay the uh, cord clamping. But uh, for HIV, there is still, I think there is no guidelines regarding delayed cord clamping or early cord clamping. Okay, one more question from yeah. the pediatrician is how to do a umbilical cord milking? Dr. Akash, please. Yeah. I think Akash, can I answer this because so it it is done in strokes so if you should give at least three to five strokes starting from the mother end to the baby end so this is umbilical cord milking and each stroke should be of around two seconds so you will pinch from the mother side and bring it towards the baby's side and this stroke should be of two seconds and you you have to give three to five strokes now I will tell you why it has not to be done in preterm babies. Because in preterm babies, it has been shown to increase the risk of IVH. Only it was useful. Now they, uh, in term baby also, they compared it with the delayed cord clamping. Milking and delayed cord clamping. What they have found is there is no difference between the blood which, which is transferred either by delayed cord clamping or milking. Milking is only helpful in one situation. That is when the baby... Uh, when you are doing caesarean section of the mother who is not in labor. So, basically, when you are doing elective caesarean section, the, there is the tone of uh, the uterus is very less. So, by delayed cord clamping, you will not get so much of blood which is required. At that point of time, you can do milking. Second point is, suppose there is you are finding that in the hysterotomy wound, there is so much of bleeding is going on then you can do milking. These are one or two situations where you can do milking, but surely not below 28 weeks. It is below 32 weeks because now one study has shown that even below 32 weeks of age, it, it causes increased incidence of IVH. So remember, if the baby is term and he is going for elective caesarean section without tonic uh, uterus, then only this milking will help. It has to be done in three to five strokes, each stroke for two seconds. A uh, question because same yeah. cord. Uh, yeah. Ek ki whether you uh, do the milking after the cord is cut or before cord is cut, there are two different. Yeah, yeah there are two two type of thing: intact cord milking and uh, cut cord milking. So both can be done. In cut cord milking, you will not get much much benefit because the only in that segment of cord, the blood which is present will go inside, and in intact cord clamping, the amount of blood will increase because after one stroke it will refill then you will do it so in uh, cut cord milking only once it will be of any benefit so it is of not much benefit cut cord milking is not good 
So one very practical questions I yeah. have got. Uh, practically, very few centers in India are putting the baby immediately on mother's abdomen. Uh, no, 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 no. I don't agree. I don't agree. Number of centers have increased. Just okay. question, okay. Question, okay. Question, okay. Question, okay. Okay. Yes, but yes. They've increased. They've definitely increased quite a bit. Go ahead. Sorry. No, yes. No. Yes. Even smaller, Any? even small, small nursing homes, including SNCUs and even smaller district level places have started doing this. No, only thing is Akash, what he's trying to uh, ask is okay, how you, we should convince. The first thing is if you want to deliver the baby on, onto the mother's abdomen, you will have to convince the obstetrician who is delivering the baby. The problem and, is uh, we only say that do it onto the mother's abdomen and we don't tell them the benefits of doing it. So there are many benefits of doing it. So uh, as a pediatrician, you should explain it to each and everyone the obstetrician and the nurses who are handling the uh, labor. Then only they will... It is not for... There is one uh, misinformation that it is only for temperature control. No, it is not only for the temperature control. If the baby is put on the mother's abdomen, the probiota of the baby changes significantly. If you put it in, into any other tray or any other hospital equipment, the, there is chances of getting nosocomial infection on the skin. So it prevents sepsis, it prevents many things. It will help in delayed cord clamping, better yeah. mother bonding, uh, initiation of breast milk, uh, breastfeeding. So there is not uh, not only a single. They think that we have radiant warmer. Why we need to keep it on mother's abdomen? We have uh, best radiant warmer available with us. So tell them, please tell them that it is not only for temperature regulation. It is not the same thing happens with KMC. People think it is for the temperature regulation. It is poor man's radiant warmer. It is not poor man's radiant warmer. So that has to be explained very clearly. And also in caesarean section, you should put the baby onto the mother's abdomen. For that, the skin-to-skin -skin contact may not be possible immediately. But at least you should tell them to have in their obstetric drum, uh, two sheets should be available for baby autoclave sheets. So whenever they are putting, uh, making their trolley, they should keep two autoclave sheets for newborn baby and spread it over to the abdomen of mother. As soon as baby is delivered, they should keep on to that uh, sheets, clean it. When they cut the cord, then they slip. They can slip the baby onto the chest of the mother for skin to skin contact. Then, uh, uh, Vikas, I beg to differ, and in fact, that is the question I wanted to answer. Even in C section, you were saying that. Uh, obstetrician or mother ko counsel karna zaruri hai. I was going to add ki you need to, especially in C-section, anesthetist ko counsel karna bahut zaruri uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in many hospitals, we have anesthetists who keep kind of a curtain. A curtain yeah. hai between chest and abdomen. Yes. So you can give the baby, you can keep the baby on mother's chest. You can put the baby below that curtain and yeah. put, it, put the baby between so, mother's breast. So, yeah. so I, I, would, I, would, I, I wouldn't defer, but I have uh, advice which one of my students showed me. Ki find out who influences the obstetrician, whether it is a senior anesthetist, somebody who is a senior anesthetist, somebody who is a senior anesthetist, who is a senior anesthetist, who is a senior anesthetist, who is a senior anesthetist. Sir, one more question, similar question. Yeah. How many centers in India are using ECG during resuscitation? Uh, wait, wait, wait. wait. I, let me answer. I don't know about not India, not but not. even in the US, I think 40 50 centers. 40 40-50 percent center users. So I'm sure in India may koi nahi Nobody karta. Ek, ek ya do karte honge. It doesn't matter. Nobody is even. Single lead ECG bhi use kar sakte hai for uh, that particular thing. Um, uh, Ronak, it can be used kyunki sabke paas abhi monitor hota hai. Toh it is uh, three lead ECG is not required for that. I think single lead ECG will give you the heart rate. So, so we only required heart rate. So, there is a... Yeah, yeah. Let, let me let me just show this slide. This is from a different presentation, but uh, Vikas mentioned about warmer. Yeah. So this is a very old study from 1990, and if you look at the three three slides, XX is skin to skin at birth and yeah. continuing. So this is around uh, 60 minutes or so, and this is uh, skin to skin uh, at birth and then transfer to warmer. This is what many people do, and this is from warmer from the beginning. So you can see the difference in temperature. This is in Fahrenheit. And this is a 1980 study. If you start from uh, what because we specifically saying that warmer is very good. Some people say that warmer is good, so warmer is not good. This is a comparison between radiant warmer and skin to skin. And you can see skin to skin temperature is better than radiant warmer. Sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to share this particular slide. We asked our audience, is it easy to convince the gynecologist yes. for giving KM, I mean skin to skin contact, delivering mm -hmm. a baby? 
and 44% said yes it is easy but 56% says no it's not easy so no so uh, i think uh, prashant uh, yeah. for me 44% answering that it is easy to convince is a very good number actually yeah yeah and uh, wait, 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 wait. Sex, it, it is also important whether this 44% people are delivering the maximum number of babies no no dusra cheez kya hai prashant ki first they have, they have to be convinced because many of our pediatricians are also not convinced if you are not convinced you will not able to convince others okay so as a pediatrician i i think first you should get convinced for this that this makes a difference If you will think that this will only make a slight difference, ये तो सब चौंचले हैं ऐसा नया नया चीज दूर लाते रहते हैं ऐसा नहीं है इट विल हेल्प यू एंड माइंड यू यू विल प्रैक्टिस दिस यू विल फाइंड द चेंज यू विल फाइंड द चेंज ओके सो देर आर टू क्वेश्चन डॉक्टर रुचि गुप्ता दास is suction necessary after delivering babies crying immediately after birth i think we have answered it saying no. that it is not necessary not and necessary. there is another important question dr surendranath from hyderabad has asked can we do milking of cord before clamping if baby is uh, not breathing so yeah anyone wants no, to answer that no I, regarding milking of the cord na that i have made it very clear na if it is preterm baby you don't have to milk the cord But he's not. He's not, not said preterm term. He just said any yeah. baby is not breathing. Ha, huh, you can you can milk the cord. You can milk the cord. There is no nothing in that. You can milk the cord, but be cautious that you should not do it below thirty two weeks. And uh, it has got no. No, no, no. Because the qu- question is, baby is not breathing. Is what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. If baby is not breathing, then also you. Can. If baby is not breathing, then also you can do. There is no harm in it. Only thing is. There is no added advantage above delayed cord clamping. There is no added advantage. No, wait, wait. He is saying milking of cord before clamping if baby is not breathing. Yeah, yeah. If baby is not breathing, then then also. Okay. The baby is non-vigorous, then also we are delaying the cord. So yeah. you can you can milk the cord if, even if the baby is not breathing because it will be required more in that baby rather than in a baby who is vigorous. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? And so there are any questions? Yeah, there was there, there was one more question related to this only that if a baby is not breathing, can we provide PPV without cutting the cord or without clamping yeah, the cord? Yeah. Yeah. Akash, I will give answer to that. I will give answer to that. It's a complex thing. I will explain you. What happened was earlier it was thought that delayed cord clamping will help in decreasing the incidence of IVF, decreasing the incidence of BPD. decreasing the incidence of rop so there were three four major morbidities it was thought that they will be decreased by delayed cord clamping but in a recent meta analysis in 21 it was found that there was no significant difference in both the group of delayed cord clamping or early cord clamping in these morbidities so at present what they are saying is that in the major morbidity there is no difference so your point or your suggestion of intact cord resuscitation has still not occurred now they want that we should do more and more studies where the non vigorous child should be intact resuscitated and seen that whether these morbidities change or not only then we can recommend at present there is no recommendation of intact cord resuscitation as you are uh, telling only thing is it will increase the hemoglobin level iron stores so the only benefit which has been found is increase iron store for the delayed cord clamping not not else not others uh, other things have not been found significantly different sir one more question about yeah. the uh, use of plastic bags in extreme preemie are there yeah. any bags available commercially yeah commercially wagon wagon ka bag aata hai wagon company ka bag aata hai it is costly 140 to 150 rupees ka one bag hai but wagon ka ek bag hai for babies below 1 kg and uh, babies 1 1.5 or 1 to 2 kg wagon company ka aa raha hai bag and uh, but you can also use the simple plastic bags which are available food grade plastic bags yeah wo jo 20 rupees ka aata hai ziplock wala you can use it ha but wagon ka 150 rupees ka hai 150 rupees ka hai aur usme wo topi bhi ban jata hai usme wo rassi khechenge topi ban jayega bachcha so thoda to acha hai uska so shall i continue yes sir yeah. so we are here i think chest compression so there are different ways of doing uh, though remember uh, the way in which chest compressions were done has changed in the book from the uh, bottom from the leg end towards the uh, head end uh, there is no confirmation that we using 100% during chest compression is better but that is the current recommendation okay uh, so that is something which we need to understand so whenever we do chest compressions our fio2 option should go to 
hundred percent, and we can we need to use two thumbs encircling techniques. And currently, now it is said that we should try and do it from the uh, head end. Okay, so that's that's kind of very clear now. Uh, so it all allows you to put the umbilical venous catheter and so on and so forth. Uh, IV access uh, mainly the umbilical venous catheterization. That's the main way which in which you can you should have IV access. Dosing has slightly changed. If you look at this, okay, uh, the range of uh, endotracheal uh, what do you say? Dose has uh, changed uh, slightly, uh, and so this is something which has changed from 0.01 uh, to 0.03 to it has become 0.02. Okay, so that has kind of uh, changed. So this instead is... instead of Somsekar range, they have fixed it because range everybody was confused. Now uh -huh. it is 0.2 ml for endotracheal root and uh -huh. one ml for uh, sorry one ml for endotracheal root and 0.2 for umbilical. Root. Right. So it is so, easier to understand, easier for ease. Uh, they have done this. There is no other thing. So if you look at AH and ERC, look at what happened. Sodium bicarbonate, we say in AH and ILCO, they're not to be used. ERC actually says you can consider in prolonged recommendation. Okay. okay. Uh, glucose infusion, uh, ERC says uh, it gives a specific recommendation of using uh, IV glucose. Uh, 2.5 ml per kg of 10% glucose. Then naloxone, it mentions, uh, initially it was there in the AHA recommendations, but I think in 2010 they removed it. Uh, but ERC still ment uh, maintains, okay? But we are we are not using opioids in labor in India. So uh, but like a, actually, uh, compared to... Narcotic uh, addicted mothers. Yeah, the yeah. addicted mothers, or we are, if we are in giving opioids for pain, pain relief. So we are not using opioids. So, but this is their recommend in case. Uh, but yeah, actually, uh, I think US is more of a drug problem as compared to Europe, but still Europe has the recommendation and the US does not have a recommendation. Yeah. Uh, this we can use O negative blood at any point of time. Do yeah. Dosing is 10 ml per kg. Okay, post resuscitation care. Uh, you should not have any unintentional hypothermia. We should have proper normal temperature of the baby at birth. Mm -hmm. If you want to do intentional hypothermia, if you want to do cooling, that's a different matter. But unintentional hypothermia should not be allowed to occur. We have to maintain the body temperature appropriately. And you can uh, do, can, can be done rapidly or slowly rewarming. It does not matter between the two, uh, two ways. Uh, withholding this resuscitation now is 20 minutes after birth. Okay, ye tha ki 10 minutes after all resuscitation has been done properly. Now it says 20 minutes after birth. This is based on actually on a case series uh, that was published, which showed that babies resuscitated beyond 10 minutes uh, of, of good resuscitation also tended to have good neurological outcomes. Okay, so that was so it was based on a case series. Uh, this uh, now this is something which was interesting, which was not. Uh, what happens is when you do a training, like we have been doing trainings in NRP in basic and advanced NRP for uh, almost 10, 12 years. Uh, it has been seen that generally after three months or five months. Uh, the skills vanish if they're not practiced on a regular basis. Okay. If you don't practice on a regular basis, those skills vanish. Uh, so that is important. Is regular skills. So uh, AHA or AAP has been recommending uh, re, um, the recertification of the skills every two years, two, every, every two years. Uh, but there is evidence to say that even doing it every two years once will not allow you to maintain the skills. So th there was, there was discussion whether we should do it every six months. So people thought that every six months people should get trained. But then what had happens if you try and do it every six months, the number of trainings that you need to do or number of people you need to train increases a mm, huge number. And it, and it becomes uh, expensive. And it, 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 Though you might think that every six months you'll remember, but it may not be useful or it may not be practicable solution. So they did not bother much about it. But uh, what has not been discussed is a high frequency uh, low intensity training. So you practice some skills every week, every two weeks. And so if you regularly practice some small skills uh, on a high frequency, but very low, uh, very uh, not like a six hour training, but you do a half hour and half an hour training of this bag and mask or half an hour of initial steps every, every week or half an hour of say intubation every week, something like that. So if you do that on a regular basis, then you will try and you will ensure that skills are maintained. So it's not proven, but that's probably the future. Okay. Uh, okay. Then this is briefing and debriefing. We'll not discuss in detail, yeah. but it's very important. Uh, let's keep this because that's a completely different uh, yeah. way. So you can look at the two uh, guidelines. So they look completely different. I would prefer the HA guidelines on the left hand side because they look very uncomplicated. On the right hand side, it looks too messy and uh, too difficult to understand. They may be more more elaborate, but uh, for people. Uh, who want to have very few guidelines and to understand very clearly the guidelines on the left hand side are better. So that's up to you. 
so this is again the gaps between uh, how the algorithms are made uh, i will not go into details because i think we are at almost 440 now okay uh, so these are the various guidelines which are there i think uh, there are various gaps in knowledge which are still there and there is lots of material to kind of study and do future studies so uh, these are the slides for that so gaps in knowledge currently but i think i'll stop here yeah. yeah thank you so i know if there are any questions we can discuss further but i think we have had a very good one hour of excellent discussions mm. uh one question uh, is there in a chat box uh, uh, from dr archana one fallacy still remains with nrp the weight of the baby is not known or checked soon after the birth the recommendation for adrenaline dose is still based on weight in kg yeah, yeah. rona case mein you have to take approximate weight only and now many of them i have done ultrasounds and all those so you you have an uh, approximate idea of weight so it is not the exact weight uh, but uh, you should not give in a 1 kg baby a dose of 3 kg baby and 0.2 there is range is still there 0.1 to 0.3 but they say that you should take 0.2 so it will suffice any any miscalculation of 15 to 20% so this is of not very much a very big issue anything else yeah one more question is regarding the frequency of giving iv adrenaline yeah you you can repeat it after 2 to 3 minutes there is no number of which is defined uh, after 2 to 3 minutes you will uh, you will uh, again give the adrenaline and uh, remember you will not uh, count the endotracheal root uh, adrenaline which you have given suppose you have given endotracheal uh, adrenaline by endotracheal root and within 1 minute your umbilical venous catheter umbilical catheter is in place then you should you will have to give by umbilical catheter so that is considered to be first dose first dose one more question is there as is there any difference of gravity on cord blood yeah this is very important question that uh, uh, we should uh, keep the baby below the vagina to um, uh, make it possible for the flow of uh, blood from the mother to the baby no that gravity gravity does not play any role the amount of flow which occurs when the baby is placed on abdomen is same when the baby is placed below vagina so it doesn't makes any difference only you have to put the baby onto the mother's abdomen and wait for 60 second if the baby is crying yes dr akash uh, one more question is there any cut off of gestation in which the initiation of resuscitation is not recommended i think uh, it's okay to start not to start wait wait there is an i think you so should so is the best person to answer this question oh, yeah. i think so the, 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 the answer answer to the question is we don't know there is we should we not have a specific cut off uh, there was a email from iap in i think 2017 which said ki below 28 weeks you should it is abortion etc etc it is all wrong because i think many good centers in india many good centers in india still still can resuscitate 25 weeks and 24 weeks and ensure that they survive in your center it may not be possible it may be possible in another center so there is a, actually a very good article that we published i think in 2019 january uh, or it was in 18 january where in indian pediatrics it's freely available where it tells you how to make the decision so the decision is all local and it is based upon your local prevalence and how much you can kind of how many babies you can save at that particular gestation uh, but no one can tell you ki is gestation se niche so if you did not resuscitate uh, if you and it depends upon the approach of the physician as well as the approach of the parents so it is not a simple simple decision i can i can share a slide uh, to show uh, to show that uh, just give me a minute i can share a slide to under, to make you understand uh, what i'm talking about let me see if i can get this slide okay here i have the slide over here and i just share it appropriately shall i get one more question sir yeah yeah, yeah. go ahead go ahead go ahead go ahead go ahead uh, there is question from dr omesh kurana the labor rooms of india that is in phc and chc uh, should have uh, which nomograms i think he is asking uh, about the algorithms either erc or american No, no, yeah, no, I, no. I think no, Are no they, ERC or American. No, yes, only IP, IP, and NNF has come out with an algorithm which closely follows AP algorithm, but has is more um, uh, more suited to Indian setting and is more uh, appropriate for us. So IP algorithm can be followed. Yeah, or that basic NRP algorithm of the government of India, and which is also adapted by NSSK. the IAP NSS. Yes. 
so this is that thing i was talking about uh, boundaries of viability so the boundaries of viability differs differ according to various uh, countries okay and this is how actually uh, decisions need to be uh, taken so there is this uh, uh, there is this gray zone where you, you can't decide and there is one where below the statement is this is why generally generally uh, what do you say uh, how decisions are made so here i would put it here as something like uh, uh, 32 uh, this i would put this at around maybe 26 28. weeks for 26 or 28 weeks over here for me i would put it at 26 weeks for me uh, but somebody might say 28 weeks in a phc uh, and for here uh, i might put something like 22 weeks in for me okay and between 22 to 26 weeks is the gray zone where we have to discuss and decide what is to be done so this is in my situation somebody in hyderabad or somebody in uh, delhi in a very good high fast perinatal center uh, can put here as 25 weeks and get put here at at 22 weeks so this is how he will discuss or he will put it as 24 weeks so this is so this zone where what to be done and what not to be done will differ upon the situation so evidence based medicine is just not evidence it is evidence patients perspectives and what can be done kind of so there are various things uh, so it is a evidence based decision so this is a parental decision and and this is a parental decision unless pain to the child and this is the our problem ye kya hai humko pata hai ki 26 week mein theek hoga but there will somebody will come and say ki 28 weeks ka baby idhar hai and they will say ki we don't want to resuscitate but we know that if you resuscitate baby that baby will survive and do very well and if parents don't want it, then it becomes an issue. So these are so it's like slightly a complicated decision, and there are various reasons why. Uh, uh, what are the various probabilities? So it is very clear. The ethics of resuscitation on Yvonne lies in the probabilities that you offer, and the chances the parents are going to take with the full understanding of the consequences. So this is a grayness. So it is a gray thing. There can never be a cutoff at any place or point because even in India, so there are people saying that there are two Indias and there are three Indias. There are multiple Indias across India and so the situation in every place will differ. So we cannot have a mandated single cutoff anywhere. Because if you say 23 weeks, somebody in a PSC will, and in a very peripheral town cannot manage that. It is a waste of time and resources and, they, and if something happens, then they can get sued. And if you say 28 weeks, Somebody in Mumbai, uh, in if you deliver and if you say, hey, I don't want to resuscitate, then it's a problem because that baby can survive. So it, it, beca- it, it is a very co- uh, decision based upon place, uh, person, capability and so on and so forth. Yeah, sorry. I, I think it's I stopped there. So be, be, before we go anywhere, I wanted to kind of plug for conference. So we're doing this conference starting tomorrow. KMC conference. I don't know. Can you see the con- thing? Yeah. Yeah. Now we can see. So if, yes. if you are not registered, you can register for an online conference uh, and uh, join us. So these links are available. You can ask me or uh, I think in many of the groups, WhatsApp groups are there. So there are these various. Uh, so there is a role of obstetricians in promoting KMC in India. So somebody asked about obstetrician for skin to skin care also. So there is actually a workshop. This was based on a request that we should do it for obstetricians. Okay, and there's this IKMC, which is the new thing. And these are the older things, uh, home-based, home-based KMC and uh, facility-based KMC. These are the workshops and there is a Asia Oceania network, uh, which uh, KMC Foundation is leading for next two years, for these two years. And we are having a uh, network and we're having WHO people. In, and for the main conference, we have speakers from uh, US uh, uh, and Europe uh, who are going to be speaking. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Okay. Hey, wait, and if you can see, there's a, a Rekha Udani KMC oration. So oration, we generally believe are given by people who have done, like, so this is given by Dr. Yadaya. He's a chief medical officer of SNC because he's done a lot of good uh, Kangaroo mother care work at his government general hospital in Nalgonda. So this time the oration has been given to him. Thank you. So I think there are no more questions in chat box. Uh, Dr. Prashant, are there any questions in YouTube? No, no. Uh, we you already posted it. it on Zoom. So, over here, we will thank one and all for being here. And as a part of gratitude from NNF Gujarat, we present a certificate of appreciation to Ronak Patel for being a chairperson and moderating the session well. Also, we are thankful to Dr. Vikas Goel, Dr. Akash Ban, and our own advisor, Dr. Somshekar Nimbalkar, for being there. And let me tell you, the Zoom was full and there were more than 30 participants on YouTube also. So it was a well-attended program. Uh, well-made 
actually we will say that uh, in a shorter time only we say that the nrp will be done in a minute and that was the how this program was decided so thank you so much for to everyone for uh, answering all the queries and to all the participants we do have a same zoom link and same youtube link for all the upcoming wednesday neonatal patshala 3:30 to 4:30 so next we have a case presentation from kem uh, which will be a interesting case presentation so those who, of you who are interested can join thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you everyone thank you. bye bye bye, bye. thank you so much bye. thank you everyone